There are things known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. Aldous Huxley Good evening. Um, yep. Uh, hi, Kathy. Uh, just saying in chat that um, I originally started this live event at 1030, but um, I was ready at 10. So I just said, all right, screw it. I'll just start it. Um, I ate some frozen pizza and I, you know, it's the type that I typically eat and it did not settle well with my stomach. So it's telling me don't eat frozen pizza okay um what i'm gonna do tonight uh, as far as this episode if there are more people around and want to uh, get together and talk uh i could do a second episode after this one so i'm going to read out as huxley's the doors of perception where he got a chance to take mescaline and um kind of gives his experience now uh today uh in the united states I'm not sure about other places around the world mescaline is a class a or schedule one schedule a schedule one drug uh felony whatever um and i keep saying i'm gonna do a uh a dedicated uh, topic on why certain higher consciousness drugs are f felonies <laughs> how do they get there um, and kind of going over some of the things that are said by um, Terrence McKenna who's well known about it and Graham Hancock who's kind of uh, been diving into it uh, recently and um, it's kind of being the surge as far as a lot of celebrities and just people who just ordinary people are really going to experience these types of higher consciousness um, experiences now uh i'm gonna go ahead and read it it may take me an hour or so it's 23 pages long um and uh, i was going to do a commentary after it so if you want to stick around for either just let me know if not you can just go ahead and not watch <laughs> or not listen uh there really won't be much behind the scenes as far as me uh doing anything and i'm actually gonna hide myself so you don't uh have to see me you can just focus on listening in and if you want to read along you can read along since i'm just gonna read live all right here we go the doors of perception aldous huxley it was in 1886 that the German pharmacologist Louis Lewin published the first systematic study of the cactus, to which his own name was subsequently given, and Halonium Lewinii was new to science. To primitive religion and the Indians of Mexico and the American Southwest, it was a friend of immemorially long standing. Indeed, it was much more than a friend. In the words of one of the early Spanish visitors to the New World, they eat a root which they call peyote, and which they venerate as though it were a deity. Why they should have venerated it as a deity became apparent when such eminent psychologists as James Havelock Ellis and Ware Mitchell began their experiments with mescaline, the active principle of peyote. True, they stopped short at a point well the side of idolatry, but all concurred in, in assigning to mescaline a position among drugs of unique distinction. Administered in suitable doses, it changes the quality of consciousness more profoundly and yet is less to toxic than any other substance in the pharmacologist's repertory. Mescaline research has been going on sporadically ever since the days of Lewin and Havelock Ellis. 
Chemists have not merely isolated the alkaloid, they have learned how to synthesize it so that the supply no longer depends on the sparse and intermittent crop of a desert cactus. Alienists have dosed themselves with mescaline in the hope of hope thereby of coming to a better, a first-hand understanding of their patient's mental processes, working unfortunately upon too few subjects within too narrow a range of circumstances, psychologists have observed and cataloged some of the drug's more striking effects. Neurologists and physiologists have found out so something about the mechanism of its action upon the central nervous system. And at least one professional philosopher has taken mescaline for the light it may throw on such ancient unsolved riddles as the place of mind in nature and the relationship between brain and consciousness. There matters rested until two or three years ago a new and perhaps, perhaps highly significant fact was observed. Actually, the fact had been staring everyone in the face for several decades, but nobody, as it happened, had noticed it until a young English psychiatrist at present working in Canada, Canada was struck by the close similarity in chemical composition between mescaline and adrenaline. Further research revealed that lysergic acid, an extremely potent hallucinogen derived from ergo, has a structural biochemical relationship to the others. Then came the discovery that adrenochrome, which is a product of the decomposition of adrenaline, can produce many of the symptoms observed in mescaline intoxication, but adrenochrome probably occurs spontaneously in the human body. In other words, each one of us may be capable of manufacturing a chemical, minute doses of which are known to cause profound changes in consciousness. Certain of these changes are similar to those which occur in that most characteristic plague of the 20th century, schizophrenia. Is the mental disorder due to a chemical disorder? And is the chemical disorder due, in its turn, to psychological distresses affecting the adrenals? It would be rash and premature to affirm it. The most we can say is that some kind of prima facie case has been made out. Meanwhile, the clue is being systematically followed. The sleuths, biochemists, psychiatrists, psychologists are on the trail. By a series of, for me, extremely fortunate circumstances, I found myself in the spring of 1953 squarely athwart that trail. One of the sleuths have come on business to California. In spite of 70 years of mescaline research, the psychological material at, its disposable, at his disposal was still absurdly inadequate, and he was anxious to add to it. I was on the spot and willing, indeed eager, to be a guinea pig. Thus it came about that, one bright May morning, I swallowed four-tenths of a gram of mescaline dissolved in half a glass of water and sat down to wait for the results. We live, to the, we live together, we act on and react to one another, but always and in all circumstances we are by ourselves. The martyrs go hand in hand into the arena, they are crucified alone. Embraced, the lovers desperately try to fuse their insulated ecstasies into a single self-transcendence, in vain. By its very nature, every embodied spirit is doomed to suffer and enjoy in solitude. Sensations, feelings, insights, fancies, all these are private, and except through symbols and at second hand, incommunicable. We can pool information about experiences, but never the experiences themselves. From family to nation, every human group is a society of island universes. Most island universes are su sufficiently like one another to permit of inferential understanding or even of mutual empathy or feeling into. Thus, remembering our own bereavements and humiliations, we can condole with others in analogous circumstances can put ourselves, always of course in a slightly Pickwickian sense, in their places. But in certain cases, communication between universes is incomplete or even non-existent. The mind is its own place, and the places inhabited by the insane and exceptionally gifted are so different from the places where ordinarily, ordinary men and women live, that there is little or no common ground of memory to serve as a basis for understanding or fellow feeling. Words are uttered, but fail to enlighten. 
The things and events to which the symbols refer belong to mutually exclusive realms of experience. To see ourselves as others see us is the most salutary gift. Hardly less important is the capacity to see others as they see themselves. But what if these others belong to a different species and inhab inhab and <laughs> inhabit a radically alien universe? For example, how can the saying get to know what it actually feels like to be mad? Or, short of being born again as a visionary, a medium, or a musical genius, how can we how can we ever visit the worlds which to Blake, to Swedenborg, or Johann Sebastian Bach were home? And how can a man at the extreme limits of ectomorphy and cerebrotonia ever put himself in the place of one at the limits of endomorphy and viscerotonia, or except within certain circles? circumscribed areas, share the feelings of one who stands at the limits of mesomorphy and somatonia. To the unmitigated behavior, such questions, I suppose, are meaningless, but for those who theoretically believe what in practice they know to be true, namely there is an inside to experience as well as an outside, the problems posed are real problems, all the more grave for being some completely insoluble, some soluble only <laughs> in exceptional circumstances and by methods not available to everyone. Thus, it seems virtually certain that I shall never know what it feels like to be Sir John Falstaff or Joe Lewis. On the other hand, it had always seemed to me possible that through hypnosis, for example, or auto-hypnosis by means of systemic, systemic meditation, or else by taking the appropriate drug, I might so change my ordinary mode of consciousness as to be able to know from the inside what the visionary, the medium, even the mystic were talking about. From what I had read of the mescaline experience, I was convinced in advance that the drug would admit me, at least for a few hours, into the kind of inner world described by Blake and A.E., but what I had expected did not happen. I had expected to lie with my eyes shut looking at visions of many colored geometries, of animated architectures rich with gems and fabulously lovely of landscapes with heroic figures of symbolic dramas trembling perpetually on the verge of the ultimate revelation but i had not reckoned it was evident with the idiosyncrasies of my mental makeup the facts of my temperament training and habits i am and for as long as i can remember i have always been a poor visualizer Words, even the pregnant words of poets, do not evoke pictures in my mind. No hypnagogic visions greet me on the verge of sleep. When I recall something, the memory does not present itself to me as a vividly seen event or object. By an effort of the will, I can evoke a not very vivid image of what happened yesterday afternoon, of how the Longarno used to look before the bridges were destroyed, of the Bayswater Road when only when the only buses were green and tiny and drawn by aged horses at three and a half miles an hour. But such images have little substance and absolutely no autonomous life of their own. They stand to real perceived objects in the same relation as Homer's ghost did to the men of flesh and blood who came to visit them in the shades. Only when I have a high temperature do my mental images come to independent life. To those in whom the faculty of visualization is strong, my inner world must seem curiously drab, limited and uninteresting. This was the world, a poor thing of my own, which I expected to see transformed into something completely unlike itself. The change which actually took place in that world was in no sense revolutionary. Half an hour after swallowing the drug, I became aware of a slow dance of golden lights. A little later, there were sumptuous red surfaces swelling and expanding from bright nodes of energy that vibrated with a continuously changing pattern life. At another time, the closing of my eyes revealed a complex of gray structures, within which pale bluish spheres kept emerging into intense solidity, and having emerged, would slide noiselessly upwards out of sight. But at no time were there faces or forms of men or animals. I saw no landscapes, no enormous spaces, no magical growth and metamorphosis of buildings, nothing remotely like a drama or a parable. The other world to which Mescaline admitted me was not the world of visions. It existed out there in what I could see with my eyes open. The great change was in the realm of objective fact. What had happened to my subjective universe was relatively unimportant. I took my pill at 11. An hour and a half later, I was sitting in my study looking intently at a small glass vase. The vase contained only three flowers, a full-blown belly of Portugal rose, shell pink with a hint 
at every petal's base of a hotter, flamier hue. A large magenta and cream-colored carnation and <clears throat> pale purple at the end of its broken stalk. The bold heraldic blossom of an iris. Fortuitous and provisional, the little nosegay broke all the rules of traditional good taste. At breakfast that morning, it had been struck by the lively dissonance of its colors. But that was no longer the point. I was now... I was not looking at an unusual flower arrangement. I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of his creation, the miracle, moment by moment of naked existence. Is it agreeable? Somebody asked. During this part of the experiment, all conversations were recorded on a dictating machine, and it has been possible for me to refresh my memory of what was said. Neither agreeable nor disagreeable, I answered. It just is. Estigit. Wasn't that the word Mr. Eckhart liked to use? Isness, the being of Platonic philosophy, except that Plate seems to have made the enormous, the grotesque mistake of separating being from becoming and identifying it with the mathematical abstraction of the idea. He could never, a poor fellow, have seen such a bunch of flowers shining within their own inner light and all but quivering under the pressure of the significance which they were charged. I could never have perceived what they rose, what rose and iris and carnation so intensely signified was nothing more and nothing less than what they were. A transience that was yet eternal life, a perpetual perishing that was at the same time pure being, a bundle of minute or minute uh, unique particulars in which, by some unspeakable and yet self-evident paradox, was to be seen the divine source of all existence. I continued to look at the flowers, and in their living light I seemed to detect a qualitative equivalent of breathing, but of a breathing without returns to a starting point, with no recurrent ebbs, but only a repeated flow from beauty to heightened beauty, from deeper to ever deeper meaning. Words like grace and transfiguration came to mind, and this of course was what, among other things, they stood for. My eyes traveled from the rose to the carnation and from that feathery incandescence to the smooth scrolls of sentient amethyst, which were the iris. The beatific vision sat chit ananda, being awareness bliss for the first time I understood, not on the verbal level, level not by inchoate hints or at a distance, but precisely and completely what those prodigious syllables referred to. And then I remembered a passage I had read in one of Suzuki's essays. What is the Dharma body of the Buddha? The Dharma, Dharma body of the Buddha is another way of saying mind, suchness, the void, the Godhead. The question is asked in the Zen monastery by an earnest and bewildered novice. And with the prompt irrelevance of one of the Marx brothers, the master answers, the hedge at the bottom of the garden, and the man who realizes this truth, the nobius, the novice, dubiously inquires, what may I ask is he? Gacho gives him a whack over the shoulders with his staff and answers a golden-haired lion. It had been, when I read it, only a vague, vaguely pregnant piece of nonsense. Now it was all clear as day, as evident as Euclid. Of course, the Dharma body of the Buddha was the hedge at the bottom of the garden. At the same time, no less obviously, it was those flowers. It was anything that I, or rather the blessed, not I, released for a moment from my throttling embrace, cared to look at. The books, for example, with which my study walls were lined. Like the flowers, they glowed. When I looked at them, with brighter colors, a profounder significance. Red books like rubies, emerald books, books bound in white jade, books of agate, of aquamarine, of yellow topaz, lapis lazuli books, whose color was so intense, so intrinsically meaningful that they seem to be on the point of leaving the shelves to thrust themselves more insistently on my attention. What about spatial relationships? The investigator inquired as I was looking at the books. It was difficult to answer. True. The perspective looked rather odd and the walls of the room no longer seemed to meet in right angles, but these were not really important facts. The really important facts were that spatial relationships had ceased to matter very much and that my mind was perceiving the wor world in terms of other than spatial categories. At ordinary times, the eye concerns itself with such problems as where, how far, how situated in relation to what. In the masculine experience, the implied questions to which the eye responds are of another order. 
place and distance cease to be of cease to be of much interest. The mind does its perceiving in terms of intensity of existence, profundity of significance, per relationships within a pattern. I saw the books, but was not at all concerned with their positions in space. What I noticed was impressed. What what I noticed what impressed itself upon my mind was the fact that all of them glowed with living light, and in some, the glory was more manifest than in others. In this context, position and the three dimensions were beside the point. Not, of course, that the category of space had been abolished. When I got up and walked about, I could do so quite normally without mis misjudging the whereabouts of objects. Space was still there, but it had lost its predominance. The mind was primarily concerned not with measures and locations, but with being and meaning. And along with indifference to space, there went an even more complete indifference to time. There seems to be plenty of it. Was all I could, was all I would answer, when the investigator asked me to say what I felt about time. Plenty of it, but exactly how much was it entirely irrelevant. I could, of course, have looked at my watch, but my watch I knew was in another universe. My actual experience had been was still of an indefinite duration, or alternatively, of a perpetual present made up of one continually changing apocalypse. From the books, the investigator directed my attention to the furniture. A small typing table stood in the center of the room. Beyond it, from my point of view, was a wicker chair and beyond that a desk. The three pieces formed an intricate pattern of horizontals, uprights, and diagonals, a pattern all the more interesting for not being interpreted in terms of special relationships. Table, chair, and desk came together in a composition that was like something of Brock or Juan, Juan Gris. A still life recognizable related to the objective world, but rendered without depth, without any attempt at photographic realism. I was looking at my furniture, not as the utilitarian who has to sit on chairs to write at desks and tables, and not as a cameraman or scientific recorder, but as the pure aesthete whose concern is only with forms and a relationship within the field of vision or the picture space. But as I looked at this purely aesthetic cubist's eye view gave place to what I can only describe as the sacramental vision of reality. I was back where I had been when I was looking at the flowers back in a world where everything shone with the inner light and was infinite in its significance. The legs, for example, of that chair, how miraculous their tubularity, how supernatural their polished smoothness. I spent several minutes, or was it several centuries, not merely gazing at those bamboo legs, but actually being them, or rather being myself in them, or to be still more accurate, for I was not involved in the case, nor in a certain sense were they, being my not-self in the not-self which was the chair. Reflecting on my experience, I could I find myself agreeing with the eminent Cambridge philosopher, Dr. C. D. Broad, <laughs> that we should do well to consider much more seriously than we have hit their toe been inclined to do the type of theory which Bergson put forward in connection with memory and sense perception. The suggestion is that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. Each person is at each moment capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. The function of the brain nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment and leaving only that very small and special selection which is likely to be practically useful. According to such a theory, each one of us is potentially mind at large. But insofar as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive. To make biological survival possible, mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness which will help us stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. To formulate and express the contents of this reduced awareness, man has invented and endlessly elaborated those symbol systems and implicit philosophies which we call languages. Every individual is at once the beneficiary and the victim of the linguistic tradition into which he has been born, the beneficiary inasmuch as language gives access to the accumulated records of other people's experience. 
the victim insofar as it confirms him in the belief that reduced awareness is the only awareness as it bedevils his sense of reality, so that he is all too apt to take his concepts for data, his words for actual things, that which in the language of religion is called this world, is the universe of reduced awareness, expressed and as it were petrified by language. The various other worlds with which human beings radically make contact are so many elements in the totality of the awareness belonging to mind at large. Most people, most of the time, only know, know only what comes through the reducing valve and is consecrated as generally real by the local language. Certain persons, however, seem to be born with a kind of bypass that circumvents the reducing valve. The, in others, temporary bypasses may be acquired either spontaneously or as the result of deliberate spiritual exercises, or through hypnosis, or by means of drugs. Though these permanent or temporary bypasses their flows, not indeed the perception of everything that is happening everywhere in the universe, for the bypass does not abolish the reducing valve, which still excludes the total content of mind at large, but something more than and above uh, something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material which our narrowed individual minds regard as a complete or at least sufficient picture of reality. The brain is provided with a number of enzyme systems which serve to coordinate its working. Some of these enzymes regulate the supply of glucose to the brain cells. Mescaline inhibits the production of these enzymes and thus lowers the amount of glucose available to an organ that is in constant need of sugar. When mescaline reduces the brain's normal ration of sugar, what happens? Too few cases have been observed, and therefore a comprehensive answer cannot be given, yet be given. But what happens to the majority of the few who have taken mescaline under supervision can be summarized as follows. The ability to remember and to think straight is little, if at all, reduced. Listening to the recordings of my conversation under the influence of the drug, I cannot discover that I was then any stupider than I am at ordinary times. Visual impressions are greatly intensified, and I recover some of the perceptual innocence of childhood. When the sensum was not immediately and automatically subordinated to the concept, interest in space is diminished, and interest in time falls almost to zero. Though the intellect remains unimpaired, and though perception is enormously improved, the will suffers a profound change for the worse. The masculine taker sees no reason for doing anything in particular and finds most of the causes for which, at ordinary times, he is prepared to act and suffer profoundly uninteresting. <laughs> he can't be bothered with them, for the good reason that he has better things to think about. These better things may be experienced, experienced as I experience them, out there, or in here, or in both worlds, the inner and the outer, simultaneously or successively. That they are better seems to be self-evident to all masculine takers who come to the drug with a sound liver and an untroubled mind. These effects of mescaline are the sort of effects you could expect to follow the administration of a drug having the power to impair the efficiency of the cerebral reducing valve. When the brain runs out of sugar, the undernourished ego grows weak, can't be bothered to undertake the necessary chores, and loses all interest in those spatial and temporal relationships which mean so much to an organism bent on getting on in the world. As mind at large seeps past the no longer watertight valve, all kinds of biologically useless things start to happen. In some cases, there may be extrasensory perceptions. Other persons discover a world of visionary beauty. To others, again, is revealed the glory, the infinite value and meaningfulness of naked existence, of the given, unconceptualized event. In the final stage of egolessness, there is an obscure knowledge that all is in all, that all is actually each. This is as near, I take it, as a finite mind can ever come to perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. In this context, how significant is the enormous heightening under mescaline of the perception of color? For certain animals, it is biologically very important to be able to distinguish, distinguish certain hues, but beyond the limits of their utilitarian spectrum, most creatures are completely colorblind. Bees, for example, spend most of their time deflowering the fresh virgins of the spring, but as von Frisch has shown, they, have, they can recognize only very few colors. Man's highly developed color sense is a biological luxury. Inestimably precious to him as an intellectual and spiritual being, but unnecessary to his survival as an animal. 
To judge by the adjectives which Homer puts into their mouths, the heroes of the Trojan War hardly excel the bees in their capacity to distinguish colors. In this respect, at least, mankind's advance has been prodigious. <clears throat> Mescaline raises all colors to a higher power and makes the percipient aware of innumerable fine shades of differences to which at ordinary times he is completely blind. It would seem that for mind at large, the so-called secondary characters, the character, characters of things are primary. Unlike Locke, it evidently feels that colors are more important, worth attending to, than masses, positions, and dimensions. Like mescaline takers, many mystics perceive supernaturally brilliant colors, not only with the inward eye, but even in the objective world around them. Similar reports are made by psychics and sensitives. There are certain mediums to whom the mescaline taker's brief revelation is a matter during long periods of daily and hourly experience. From this long but indispensable excur excursion into the realm of theory, we may now return to the miraculous facts. Four bamboo chair legs in the middle of a room, like Wordsworth's daffodils, they brought all manner of wealth, the gift beyond price of a new direct insight into the very nature of things, together with a more modest treasure of understanding in the field, especially of the arts. A rose is a rose is a rose. But these chair legs were chair legs, were St. Michael and all angels. Four or five hours after the event, when the effects of a cerebral sugar shortage were wearing off, I was taken for a little tour of the city, which included a visit towards sundown to what is modestly claimed to be the world's biggest drugstore. At the back of the world's biggest drugstore, among the toys, the greeting cards, and the comics stood a row. Surprisingly enough of art books, I picked up the first volume that came to hand. It was on Van Gogh, and the picture at which the book opened was The Chair, that astounding portrait of a ding and sitch that the mad painter saw with a kind of adoring terror and tried to render on his canvas, but it was a task to which the power even of genius proved wholly inadequate. The chair Van Gogh had seen was obviously the same, the same in essence as the chair I had seen, but though incomparably more real than the chairs of ordinary perception. The chair in his picture remained no more than an unusually expressive symbol of the fact. A fact had been manifested suchness. This was only an emblem. Such emblems are sources of true knowledge about the nature of things, and this true knowledge may serve to prepare the mind which accepts it for immediate insights on its own account, but that is all. However expressive, symbols can never be the things they stand for. It would be interesting in this context to make a study of the works of art available to great knowers of suchness. What sort of pictures did Eckhart look at? What sculptures and paintings played in the religious experience of St. John of the Cross? of Hakun, of Huineng, of William Law. The questions are beyond my power to answer, but I strongly suspect that most of the great knowers of suchness paid very little to art, some refusing to have anything to do with it at all, others being content with what a critical eye could regard as second-rate or even tenth-rate works. To a person whose transfigured and transfiguring mind can see the all in every this, the first rateness or tenth rateness of even a religious painting will be a matter of the most sovereign indifference. Art, I suppose, is only for beginners or else or for those resolute dead enders who have made up their minds to be content with their such of suchness, with symbols rather than with what they signify, with the elegantly composed recipe in lieu of actual dinner. I returned the Van Gogh to its rack and picked up the volume standing next to it. It was a book on Botticelli. I turned the pages. The Birth of Venus, never one of my favorites. Mars and Venus, that loveliness so passionately denounced by poor Ruskin at the height of his long-drawn sexual tragedy. The marvelous, marvelously rich and intricate Calumny of Appels, and then a somewhat less familiar and not very good picture, Judith. My attention was arrested when I gazed in fascination, not at the pale neurotic heroine or her attendant, not at the victim's hairy head or the vernal landscape in the background, but at the purplish silk of Judith's pleated bodice and long wind-blown skirts. This was something I had, seen I had seen before, seen that very morning between the flowers and the furniture when I looked down by chance and went on passionately staring by choice at my own crossed legs, whose folds in the trousers, those folds in the trousers 
What a labyrinth of endlessly significant complexity in the texture of the gray flannel. How rich, how deeply, mysteriously sumptuous. And here they were again in Botticelli's picture. Civilized human beings wear clothes. Therefore, can be no, therefore there can be no portraiture, no mythological, mythological or historical s storytelling without representations of folded textiles. But though it may account for the origins, mere tailoring can never explain the luxuriant development of drapery as a major theme of all the plastic arts. Artists, it is obvious, have always loved drapery for its own sake, or rather for their own. When you paint or carve drapery, you are painting or carving forms which, for all practical, <laughs> for all practical purposes, are non-representational. The kind of unconditioned forms on which artists, even the most naturalistic tradition, like to let themselves go. In the average Madonna or Apostle, the strictly human, fully representational element accounts for about 10% of the whole. All the rest consists of many colored variations on the inexhaustible theme of crumpled wool or linen. And these non-representational nine-tenths of a Madonna or an Apostle may, just, may be just as important qualitatively as they are in quantity. Very often they set the tone of the whole work of art. They state the key in which the theme is being rendered. They express the mood, the temperament, the attitude to life of the artist. Stoical serenity reveals itself in the smooth surfaces, the broad, untortured folds of Piero's draperies. Torn between fact and wish, between cynicism and idealism, Bernini tempers the all but character caricatural verisimilitude of his faces with enormous sartorial abstractions, which are the embodiment in stone or bronze of the everlasting commonplaces of rhetoric. Their heroism, the holiness, the sublimity to which mankind perpetually aspires, for the most part in vain. And here are El Greco's disquietly, <laughs> disquieti disquietingly visceral skirts and mantles. Here are the sharp, twisting, flame-like folds in which Cosimo Tura closes figures. In the first, the traditional spirituality breaks down into a nameless physiological yearning. In the second, there arrives an agonized sense of the world's essential strangeness, strangeness and hostility. To consider what, what how his men and women play lutes, get ready for balls and harlequinades, Embark on velvet lawns and under noble trees, for the cythera of every lover's dream, their enormous melancholy and the flayed, excruciatingly sensibility of the crea creator find expression, not in the actions recorded, not in the gestures and the faces portrayed, but in the relief of texture of their taffeta skirts, their satin capes and doublets, not an inch of smooth surface here, not a moment of peace or confidence, only a silken wilderness of countless tiny pleats and wrinkles. With an insistent, incessant modulation, inner uncertainty rendered with the perfect assurance of a master hand, of tone into tone, of one indeterminate color into another. In life, man proposes, God disposes. In the plastic arts, the proposing is done by the subject matter. That which disposes is ultimately the artist's temperament. Approximately, at least in portraiture, history, and genre, the carved or painted drapery. Between them, these two may decree that a fete gallant shall move to tears, that a crucifixion shall be serene to the point of cheerfulness, that a stigmatization shall be almost intolerably, <laughs> intolerably sexy, that the likeness of a prodigy of female brainlessness, I am, not, I am thinking now of Ingres' incomparable Mamotissier, shall express to os Osterest the most uncompromising intellectuality. But this is not the whole story. Draperies, as I had now discovered, are much more than, more than devices for introduction of non-representational forms, internaturalistic paintings and sculptures. What the rest of us see only under the influence of mescaline, the artist is congenitally equipped to see all the time. His perception is not limited to what is biologically or socially useful. A little of the knowledge belonging to mind at large oozes past the reducing valve of brain and ego into his consciousness. It is knowledge of the intrinsic significance of every existent. For the artist, as for the masculine taker, draperies are living hieroglyphs that stand in some peculiarly expressive way for the unfathomable mystery of pure being. More, more, more even than a chair, Though less perhaps than those holy supernatural flowers, the folds of my 
gray flannel trousers were charged with isness. To what they owed this privileged status, I cannot say. Is it perhaps because the forms of folded drapery are so strange and dramatic that they catch the eye and in this way force the miraculous fact of sheer existence upon the attention? Who knows? What is important is less the reason for the experience than the experience itself. Pouring over, over drew the skirts there in the world's biggest drugstore, I knew that Botticelli and that Botticelli alone. But many others too had looked at drapery's with the same transfigured and transfiguring eyes as had been mine that morning. They had seen the estigate, the honest in infinity of folded cloth, and had done their best to render it in paint or stone. Necessarily, of course, without success, for the glory and the wonder of pure existence belong to another order, beyond the power of even the highest art to express. But in Jude the skirt, I could clearly see what, if I had been a painter of genius, I might have made of my old gray flannels. Not much Heaven knows, in comparison with, thin, with the reality, but enough to delight generation after generation of beholders. Enough to make them understand at least a little of the true significance of what, in our pathetic imbecility, we call mere things and disregard in favor of television. This is how one ought to see, I kept saying as I looked down at my trousers, <laughs> glanced at the jeweled books in the shelves, at the legs of my infinitely more than Van Goghian chair. This is how one ought to see how things really are. And yet there were reservations. For if one always saw like this, one would never want to do anything else. Just looking, just being the divine, not self of flower, of book, of chair, of flannel. That would be enough. But in that case, what about other people? What about human relations? In the recording of that morning's conversations, I find the question constantly repeated. What about human relations? How could one reconcile how could one reconcile this timeless bliss of seeing as one ought to see with the temporal duties of doing what ought to do and feeling as one ought to feel? One ought to be able, I said, to see these trousers is infinitely important in human beings as still infinitely more important <laughs> or more infinitely important. One ought, but in practice seems to be impossible. This participation in the manifest glory of things left no room, so to speak, so to speak, for the ordinary, the necessary concerns of human existence, above all for concerns involving persons, for persons and ourselves, and in one respect at least, I was now a not self, simultaneously perceiving and being the not self of the things around me. To this newborn, not self, the behavior, the appearance, the very thought of the self it had momentarily ceased to be, and of other selves, its one time fellows seemed not indeed distasteful, for distastefulness was not one of the categories in terms of which I was thinking, but enormously irrelevant. Compelled by the investigator to analyze and report on what I was on report on what I was doing, and how I longed to be left alone with eternity in a flower infinity and infinity. Infinity in four chair legs and the absolute in the folds of a pair of, channel, of flannel trousers. I realized that I was being deliberately avoiding the eyes of those who were with me in the room, deliberately refraining from being too much aware of them. One was my wife, the other a man I respected and greatly liked, but both belonged to the world from which, for the moment, Mescaline had delivered me. A world of selves, of time, of moral judgments and utilitarian considerations the world and it was this aspect of human life which i wished above all else to forget of self-assertion of cocksureness of overvalued words and idolatrous worshipped notions at this stage of the proceedings i was handed a large color reproduction of the well-known self-portrait of Cezanne, the head and shoulders of a man in a large straw hat Red-cheeked, red-lipped, with rich black whiskers and a dark, unfriendly eye. It is a magnificent painting, but it was not as a painting that I now saw it, for the head promptly took on a third dimension and came to life as a small goblin-like man looking out through a window in the page before me. I started to laugh. And when they asked me why, what pretensions, I kept repeating. Who on earth does he think he is? The question was not addressed to Suzanne in particular, but to the human species at large. Who did they all think they were? <laughs> it's like Arnold Bennett in the Dolomites, I said, suddenly remembering a scene happily immortalized in a snapshot of A.B. some four or five years before his death, toddling along a wintry road at Cortina d'Ampazzo. 
and Pezzo. Uh, yeah. Around him lay the virgin snow, and the background was more than gothic aspiration of red crags. And there was kind, unhappy A.B., consciously overacting to the role of his favorite character in fiction, himself, the card in person. There he went, toddling slowly in a bright alpine sunshine, his thumbs in the armholes of a yellow waistcoat, which bulged a little lower down with the graceful curve of a regency bow window at Brighton, his head thrown back as though to aim some stammered utterance, howitzer-like at the blue dome of heaven. When he actually said, I have forgotten, but when his whole manner, air, and posture fairly shouted was, I'm as good as those damn mountains. In some ways, of course, he was infinitely better, but not as he very went, as he knew very well in the way his favorite character in fiction liked to imagine. Successfully, whatever that may mean, or unsuccessfully, we all overact the part of our favorite character in fiction. And the fact, the almost infinitely unlikely fact of actually being Suzanne makes no difference. For the consummate painter, with his little pipeline to mind at large, bypassing the brain valve and ego filter, was also in just as generally this whiskered goblin with the unfriendly eye. For a relief, I return, I turn back to the folds of my trousers. This is how one ought to see, I repeated yet again. And I might have added, these are the sort of things one ought to look at. Things without pretensions, satisfied to be merely themselves, sufficient in their suchness, not acting in part, not trying insanely to go it alone, in isolation from the Dharma body, in, Lucifer, in Luciferian defiance of the grace of God. The nearest approach to this, I said, would be a Vermeer. Yes, a Vermeer, uh, for that mysterious artist was truly gifted with the vision that perceives the Dharma body as the hedge at the bottom of the garden, with the talent to render as much of that vision as limitations of human capacity permit, and with the prudence to confine himself in his paintings to the more manageable aspects of reality. For though Vermeer represented human beings, he, always, he was always a painter of still life. Suzanne, who told his female sitters to do their best to look like apples, tried to paint portraits in the same spirit, but his Pippin-like women are more nearly related to Plato's ideas than to the Dharma body in the hedge. They are eternity and infinity seen, not in sand or flower, but in the abstractions, some superior bland, I'm sorry, superior brand of geometry. Vermeer never asked his girls to look like apples. On the contrary, he insisted on the girls being girls to the very limit, but always with the proviso that they refrain from being, from behaving girlishly. girlishly. They might sit or quietly stand, but never giggle, never display self-consciousness, never say their prayers or pine for absent sweethearts, never gossip, never gaze invasively at other women's babies, never dirt, never love or hate or work. In the act of doing any of these things, they would doubtlessly, they would doubtless become more intensely themselves, but would cease for that very reason to manifest their divine essential not-self. In Blake's phrase, the door of Vermeer's perception were only partially cleansed, a single panel had become almost perfectly transparent. The rest of the door was still muddy. The essential not-self could be perceived very clearly in things and in living creatures on the hither side of good and evil. In human beings, it was visible only when they were in repose, their minds untroubled, their bodies motionless. In these circumstances, Vermeer could see suchness in all its heavenly beauty, could see and in some small measure render it in a subtle and sumptuous still life. Vermeer is undoubtedly the greatest painter of human still lives, but there could have been others, for example. Vermeer's French contemporaries, the Lenin brothers, they set out, I suppose, to be genre painters. But what they actually produced was a series of human still lives in which their cleansed perception of the infinite significance of all things is rendered not, as with Vermeer, by subtle enrichment of color and texture, but by a heightened clarity and obsessive distinctness of form within an austere almost monochromatic tonality in our own day we have had vuillard the painter at his best of unforgettably splendid pictures of the dharma body manifested in a bourgeois bedroom of the absolute blazing away in the midst of some stockbroker's family in a suburban garden taking tea oh i'm gonna skip this part of that's in french uh okay for Laurent Telha, the spectacle was merely obscene, but if the retired rubber goods merchant had sat still enough, Villard would have seen in him only the Dharma body, 
We have painted in the Zenaeus, the goldfish pool, the Villas Moorish Tower and Chinese lanterns, a corner of Eden before the fall. But meanwhile, my question remained unanswered. How was this cleansed perception to be reconciled with the proper concern with humiliations, with the necessary chores and duties to say nothing of charity and practical compassion? The age-old debate between the actives and the contemplatives was being renewed, renewed so far as I was concerned, with an unprecedented poignancy. For until this morning I had known contemplation only in its humbler, on its own, humbler its more ordinary forms as discursive thinking as a rapt absorption in poetry or painting or music as a patient waiting upon whose inspirations without which even the prosiest writer cannot hope to accomplish anything as occasional glimpses in nature of words worth something far more deeply interfused as systematic silence leading sometimes to hints of an obscure knowledge but now i knew contemplation at its height at its height, but not yet in its fullness. For in its fullness, the way of Mary includes the way of Martha and raises it, so to speak, to its own higher power. Mescaline opens up the way of Mary, but shuts the door on that of Martha. It gives access to contemplation, but to a contemplation that is incompatible with action and even the will to action, the very thought of action. In the intervals between his revelations, the mescaline taker is apt to feel that, though in one way everything is supremely as it should be, in another, there is something wrong. His problem is essentially the same as that which confronts the quietest, the air hat, and on another level, the landscape painter and the painter of human still lives. Mescaline can never solve that problem. It can only pose it, apocalyptically, for those to whom it had never before presented itself. The full and final solution can be found only by those who are prepared to implement the right kind of and strong by means of the right kind of behavior and the right kind of constant and unstrained alertness over against the quietest stands the active contemplative the saint the man who in Eckhart's phrase is ready to come down from the seventh heaven in order to bring a cup of water to his sick brother over against the arhat retreating from appearances into an entirely transcendental nirvana stands the bodhisattva for whom suchness and a world of contingencies are one, and for whose boundless compassion every one of those contingencies is an occasion not only for transfiguring insight, but also for the most practical charity. And in the universe of art, over against Vermeer and the other painters of human still lives, over against the masters of Chinese and Japanese landscape painting, over against Constable and Turner, against Sisley and Siret and Cezanne, stands the all-inclusive art of Rembrandt. These are enormous names, inaccessible immenses. For myself, on this memorable May morning, I could only be grateful for an experience which had shown me, more clearly than I had ever seen it before, the true nature of the challenge and the complete liberating response. Let me add, before we leave the subject, that there is no form of contemplation even the most quietistic which is without its ethical values half at least of all morality is negative and consists in keeping out of mischief the lord's prayer is less than 50 words long and six of the wo those words are devoted to asking god not to lead us into temptation the one-sided contemplative leaves undone many things he ought to do but to make up for it he refrains from doing a host of things he ought not to do <laughs> The sum of evil, Pascal remarked, would be much diminished if men could only learn to sit quietly in their rooms. The contemplative, whose perception has been cleansed, does not have to stay in his room. He can go about his business, so completely satisfied to see and be a part of the divine order of things that he will never even be tempted to indulge in what Traherne called the dirty devices of the world. When we feel ourselves to be the sole heirs of the universe, when the sea flows in our veins and the stars are our jewels, then when all things are perceived as infinite and holy, what motive can we have for covetousness or self-assertion, for the pursuit of power or the dreary forms of pleasure? Contemplators, contemplatives are not likely to become gamblers or procur procurers or drunkards. They do not, rule, as a rule, preach intolerance or make war, do not find it necessary to rob, swindle, or grind the faces of the poor. And to these enormous negative virtues we may add another which, though hard to define, is both positive and important. Excuse me. The Arhat and the Quietist 
may not practice contemplation in its fullness. But if they practice it at all, they may bring back enlightening reports of another, a transcendent country of the mind. And if they practice it in the height, they will become conduits through which some beneficent influence can how out of that other country into a world of darkened selves, chronically dying for lack of it. Meanwhile, I turned at the investigator's request from the portrait of Suzanne to what was going on inside my head when I shut my eyes. This time, the inscape was curiously unrewarding. A field of vision was filled with brightly colored, constantly changing structures that seemed to be made of plastic or enameled tin. Cheap, I commented. Trivial. Like things in a 5 and 10. And all this shoddiness existed in a closed, cramped universe. It's as though one were below decks in a ship, I said. A 5 and 10 cent ship. And as I looked, it became very clear that this 5 and 10 cent ship was in some way connected with human pretensions, with the portrait of Suzanne, with A.B. among the Dolomites overacting his favorite character in fiction. This suffocating interior of a dime store ship was my own personal self, whose gym rack mobiles of tin and plastic were my personal contributions to the universe. I felt the lesson to be salutary, but was sorry, nonetheless, that it had to be administered at this moment and in this form. As a rule, the mescaline taker discovers an inner world as manifestly a datum, a self-evidently infinite and holy, and that transfigured outer world which I had seen with my eyes open. For the first, from the first, my own case had been different. Mescaline had endowed me temporarily with the power to see things with my eyes shut. But it could not, or at least on this occasion, did not reveal an inscape remotely comparable to my flowers or chair or flannels out there. What it had allowed me to perceive inside was not the Dharma body in images, but my own mind. Not suchness, but a set of symbols. In other words, a homemade substitute for suchness. Most visualizers are transformed by mescaline into visionaries. Some of them, and they are perhaps more numerous than is generally supposed, require no transformation. They are visionaries all the time. The mental species to which Blake belonged is fairly widespread, dis what is fairly widely distributed even in the urban industrial societies of the present day. The poet artist's uniqueness does not consist in the fact that, to quote from his descriptive catalog, he actually saw who, those wonderful originals called in the sacred scriptures the cherubim. It does not consist in the fact that these wonderful originals seen in my visions were some of them 100 feet in height, all containing mythological and recondite meaning. It consists solely in his ability to render in words or somewhat less successfully in line and color some hint at least of a not excessively uncommon experience. The untalented visionary mercy may perceive an inner reality no less tremendous, beautiful, and significant than the world beheld by Blake, but he lacks altogether the ability to express in literary or plastic symbols what he has seen. From the records of religion and the surviving monuments of poetry and of plastic arts, it is very plain that at most times and in most places men have attached more importance to the inscape than to its objective existence. I felt that what they saw with their eyes shut possessed a spiritually higher significance than what they saw with their eyes open. The reason? Familiarity breeds contempt, and how to survive is a problem ranging in urgency from the chronically tedious to the excruciating. The outer world is what we wake up to every morning of our lives, is the place where, willy-nilly, we must try to make our living. In the inner world, there is neither work nor monotony. We visit it only in dreams and musings, and its strangeness is such that we never find the same world on two successive occasions. What wonder, then, if human beings in their search for the divine have generally preferred to look within? Generally, but not always. In their art, no less than in their religion, the Taoists and the Zen Buddhists look beyond visions to the void, and through the void at the 10,000 things of, object of objective reality. Because of their doctrine of the world word because of the doctrine of the word made flesh, Christians should have been able from the first to adopt a similar attitude towards the universe around them. But because of the doctrine of the fall, they found it very hard to do so. As recently as three hundred years ago, an expression of thoroughgoing world denial and even world condemnation was both orthodox and comprehensible. We should feel wonder at nothing at all in nature except 
only the incarnation of Christ. In the 17th century, Lalaman's phrase seemed to make sense. Today, it has the ring of madness. In China, the rise of landscape painting to the rank of a major art form took place about a thousand, in Japan about 600, and in Europe about 300 years ago. The equation of Dharma body with hedge was made by those Zen masters who wedded Taoist tr naturalism with Buddhist transcendentalism. It was, therefore, only in the Far East that landscape painters consciously regarded their art as religious. In the West, religious painting was a matter of portraying sacred personages, of illustrating hollow texts. Landscape painters regarded themselves as secularists. Today, we realize in Surat, one of the supreme masters what may be called mystical landscape painting. And yet, this man who was able more effectively than any other to render the one in the many became quite indignant when someone, somebody praised him for the poetry of his work. I merely apply the system, he protested. In other words, he was merely a pointillist and in his own eyes, nothing else. A similar anecdote is told of John Constable. One day, towards the end of his life, Blake met Constable at Hampstead and was shown one of the younger artist's sketches. In spite of his contempt for naturalistic art, the old visionary knew a good thing when he saw it, except, of course, when it was by Rubens. This is not a drawing, he cried. This is inspiration. I admit it to be drawing, was Constable's characteristic answer. Both men were right. It was drawing, precise and voracious, and at the same time, it was an inspiration. Inspiration of an order at least as high as Blake's. The pine trees on the heath had actually been seen as identical with the Dharma body. The sketch was a rendering necessarily imperfect, but still profoundly impressive, of what a cleansed perception had revealed to the open eyes of a great painter. From a contemplation in the tradition of Wordsworth and Whitman, of the Dharma hedge as he of the Dharma body as hedge, and from visions such as Blake's of the worlds of the wonderful originals within the mind, contemporary poets have retreated into an investigation of the personal as opposed to the more than personal subconscious and to rendering in highly abstract terms, not of the given objective fact, but of mere scientific and theological notions. And something similar has happened in the held of painting, where we have witnessed a general retreat from landscape, the predominant art form of the 19th century. This retreat from landscape has not been into that other inner divine datum with which most of the traditional schools of the past were concerned, that archetypical world where men have always found the raw materials of myth and religion. No, it has been a retreat from the outward datum into the personal subconscious, into a mental world whose, <laughs> into a mental world more squalid and more tightly closed than even the world of conscious personality. These contraptions of tin and highly color colored plastic, where I had seen them before, in every picture gallery that exists in the latest non-representational art, and now someone produced a phonograph and put on a record on the turntable. I listened. I listened with pleasure, pleasure, but experienced nothing comparable to my seen apocalypses of flower and flannel. Would a naturally gifted musician hear the revelations which, for me, had been exclusively visual? It would be interesting to make the experiment. Meanwhile, though not transfigured, though retaining its normal quality and intensity, the music contributed not a little to my understanding of what had happened to me and of the wider problems which those happenings had raised. Instrumental, instrumental music, oddly enough, left me rather cold. Mozart's C minor piano concerto was interrupted after the first movement, and the recording of some madrigals by Gisualdo took its place. These voices, I said appreciatively, appreciatively these voices are a kind of bridge back to the human world, and bridge they remained even while singing the most star startlingly chromatic of the Mad Prince's compositions. Though the uneven phases of the madrigals, the music pursued its course, never sticking to the same key for two bars together. In Gisualdo, that fantastic character out of a Webster melodrama, psychological disintegration had exaggerated, had pushed to the extreme limit, a tendency inherent in modal as opposed to fully tonal music. The resulting works sounded as though they might have been written by the later Schoenberg. And yet I felt myself constrained to say as I listened to these strange products of a counter-reformation psychosis working up a late medieval art form, and yet it does not matter 
that he's all in bits. The whole is disorganized, but each individual fragment is an order, is a representation of a higher order. The highest order prevails even in the disintegration. The totality is present even in the broken pieces. More clearly present, perhaps, than in a completely coherent work, at least you weren't lulled into a sense of false security by some merely human, merely fabricated order. You have to rely on your immediate perception of the ultimate order. So in a certain sense, disintegration may have its advantages, but of course it's dangerous, horribly dangerous. Suppose you couldn't get back out of the chaos. From Gesualdo's Madrigals we jumped across the Gulf of Three Centuries to Albenberg and the Lyric Sewer. This, I announced in advance, is going to be hell. But as it turned out, I was wrong. Actually, the music sounded rather funny, dredged up from the personal subconscious. Agony succeeded twelve-tone agony, but what struck me was the only essential incongruity between a psychological disintegration even completer than Gesualdo's and prodigious resources and talent and technique employed in its expression. Isn't he sorry for himself? I commented with a derisive lack of sympathy, and then Katzen music learned Katzen music. And finally, after a few more minutes of the anguish, who cares what his feelings are? Why can't he pay attention to something else? As a criticism of what is undoubtedly a very remarkable work, it was unfair and inadequate, but not, I think, irrelevant. I cited for it what it is worth, and because that is how, in a state of pure contemplation, I reacted to the lyric suite. When it was over, the investigator suggested a walk in the garden. I was willing, and though my body seemed to have disassociated itself almost completely from my mind, or to be more accurate, though my awareness of the transfigured outer world was no longer accompanied by an awareness of my physical organism, I found myself able to get up, open the French window, and walk out with only a minimum of hesitation. It was odd, of course, to feel that I was not the same as these arms and legs out there, as this wholly objective trunk and neck and even head. It was odd, but one soon got used to it, and anyhow, the body seemed perfectly well able to look after itself. In reality, of course, it always does look after itself. All that the conscious ego can do is to formulate wishes, which are then carried out by forces which it controls very little and understands not at all. When it does anything more, when it tries too hard, for example, when it worries, when it becomes apprehensive about the future, it lowers awareness, it lowers the effect effectiveness of those forces and may even cause the devitalized body to fall ill. In my present state, awareness was not referred to as ego, it was, so to speak, on its own. This meant that the physiological intelligence controlling the body was also on its own. For a moment, that interfering neurotic who, in waking hours, tries to run a show, was blessedly out of the way. From the French window, I walked out under a kind of pergola, covered in part by a climbing rose tree, in part by last one inch wide with half an inch of space between them. The sun was shining, and the shadows of the laths made a zebra-like pattern on the ground and across the seat in the back of a garden chair which is standing at this end of the pergola. That chair, shall I ever forget it, where the shadows fell on a canvas upholstery, stripes of a deep but glowing indigo alternated with stripes of an incandesc incandescence so intensely bright that it was hard to believe that they could be made of anything but blue fire. For what seemed an immensely long time, I gazed without knowing, even without wishing to know, what it was that confronted me. At any other time, I would have seen a chair barred with alternate light and shade. Today, the percept had swallowed up the concept. I was so completely absorbed in, the, in looking, so thunderstruck by what I actually saw, that I could not be aware of anything else. Garden furniture, alas, sunlight, shadow, these were no more than names and notions. Mere verbalizations for utilitarian or scientific purposes after the event. The event was the succession of furnace doors separated by gulfs of unfathomable gentian. It was inexpressibly wonderful, wonderful to the point almost of being terrifying, and suddenly I had an inkling of what it must feel like to be mad. Because schizophrenia ha has its heavens as well as its hells and purgatories. I remember when an old friend, dead these many years, told me about his mad wife. One day in the early stages of the disease, when she still had her lucid intervals, he had gone to talk, with, to, talk to her about their children. She listened for a time, then cut him short. How could he bear to waste his time on a couple of absent children when all that really mattered here and now was the unspeakable beauty of the patterns he made in his brown tweed jacket every time he moved his arms? Alas, this paradise of cleansed perception 
A pure one-sided contemplation was not to endure. The blissful intermissions became rarer, became briefer, until finally there were no more of them. There was only horror. Most takers of mescaline experience only the heavenly part of schizophrenia. The drug brings hell and purgatory only to those who have had a recent case of jaundice or who suffer from periodical depressions or chronic anxiety. If, like the other drugs of remote comparable power, mescaline were notoriously toxic, the taking of it would be enough of itself to cause anxiety. But the reasonably healthy person knows in advance that, so far as he is concerned, mescaline is completely innocuous that its effects will pass off after 8 or 10 hours, leaving no hangover and consequently no craving for renewal of the dose. Fortified by this knowledge, he embarks upon the experiment without fear. In other words, without any disposition to convert an unprecedentedly strange and other than human experience into something appalling, something actually diabolical. Confronted by a chair which looked like the last judgment, or to be more accurate, by a last judgment, which, after a long time and with considerable difficulty, I recognized, recognized as a chair, I found myself at all at once on the brink of panic. This I suddenly felt was going too far, too far even though the going was into intenser beauty, deeper significance. The fear as I analyze it in retrospect, it was a being overwhelmed of disintegrating under a pressure of reality greater than a mind accustomed to living most of the time in a cozy world of symbols could possibly bear. The literature of religious experience bounds in references to the pains and terrors overwhelming those who have come too suddenly face to face with some manifestation of the mysterium tremendum. And theological language, this fear is due to the incompatibility between man's egotism and the divine purity, between man's self-aggravated separateness and the infinity of God. Following Bohm and William Law, we may say that by unregenerate souls, divine light in its full blaze can be apprehended only as a burning purgatorial fire. An almost identical doctrine is to be found in the Tibetan Book of the Tibet. <laughs> Sorry. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where the departed soul is described as shrinking in agony from the pure light of the void, and even from the lesser tempered lights in order to rush headlong into the comforting darkness of selfhood, as a reborn human being, or even as a beast, an unhappy ghost, a denizen of hell. Anything rather than the burning brightness of unmitigated reality. Anything. The schizophrenic is a soul not merely unregenerate, but desperately sick into the bargain. His sickness consists in the inability to take refuge from inner and outer reality, as the sane person habitually does, in the homemade universe of common sense, the strictly human world of useful notions, shared symbols, and socially acceptable conventions. The schizophrenic is like a man permanently under the influence of mescaline, and therefore unable to shut off the experience of a reality which he is not holy enough to live with, which he can't which he cannot explain away because it is the most stubborn of primary facts, and which, because it never permits him to look at the world with merely human eyes, scares him into interpreting its unremitting strangeness, its burning intensity of significance, and the manifestations of human or even cosmic malevolence, calling for the most desperate countermeasures from murderous violence at one end of the scale to catatonia, or psychological suicide at the other. And once embarks upon the downward, the infernal road, one would never be able to stop. That now was only too obvious. If you started in the wrong way, I said in answer to the investigator's questions, everything that happened would be a proof of the conspiracy against you. It would all be self-validating. You couldn't draw breath without knowing as part of the plot. So you think you know where the madness lies? My answer was a convinced and heartfelt yes. And you couldn't control it? No, I couldn't control it. If one began with fear and hate as the major premise, one would have to go on to the conclusion. Would you be able, my, would you be able, my wife asked, to fix your attention on what the Tibetan of the book calls the clear light? I was doubtful. Would it keep the evil away if you could hold it, or would you not be able to hold it? I considered the question for some time. Perhaps, I answered at last, perhaps I could, but only if there was somebody there to tell me about the clear light. One couldn't do it by oneself. 
That's the point, I suppose, of the Tibetan ritual. Someone sitting there all the time and telling you what's what. After listening to the record of this part of the experiment, I took down my copy of Evans Wentz's edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and opened at random. O oh, nobly born, let not thy mind be distracted. That was the problem. To remain undistracted, undistracted by the memory of past sins, by imagined pleasure, by the bitter aftertaste of old wrongs and humiliations, by all the fears and hates and cravings that ordinarily ellipses, eclipse the light. What those, Buddhists, what those Buddhist monks did for the dying and the dead might not the modern psychiatrist do for the insane. Let there be a voice to assure them, by day and even while they are asleep, that in spite of all the terror, all the bewilderment and confusion, the ultimate reality remains unshakably itself and is the same substance as the inner light of even the most cruelly tormented mind. By means of such devices as recorders, clock-controlled switches, public address systems, and pillow speakers, it should be very easy to keep the inmates of even an understaffed institution constantly reminded of this primordial fact. Perhaps a few of the lost souls might in this way be helped to win some measure of control over the universe, at once beautiful and appalling, but always other than human, always totally incomprehensible in which they find themselves condemned to live. None too soon I was steered away from the disquieting splendors of my garden chair, drooping in green parabolas from the hedge. The ivy fronds shone with a kind of glassy, jade-like radiance. A moment later, a clump of red-hot pokers in full bloom had exploded into my field of vision, so passionately alive that they seemed to be standing on the very brink of utterance. The flowers strained upwards into the blue. Like a chair under the laths, they protected too much. I looked down at the leaves and discovered a carnivorous intricacy of the most delicate green lights and shadows, pulsing with undecipherable mystery. Roses. The flowers are easy to paint, the leaves difficult. Shiki's haiku, which I wrote in R.H. Bleff's translation, expresses by indirection exactly what I then felt, the excessive, the too obvious glory of the flowers, as contrasted with the subtle, subtler miracle of their foliage. We walked out into the street. A large pale blue automobile was standing at the curb. At the sight of it, I was suddenly overcome, overwhelmed by enormous merriment. What complacency, what an absurd self-satisfaction being from those bulging surfaces of glossiest enamel. Man had created the thing in his own image, or rather, the image of his favorite character in fiction. I laughed till the tears ran down my cheeks. We, we re-entered the house. A meal had been prepared. Somebody who was not yet identical with myself fell to with a ravenous appetite. From a considerable distance and without much interest, I looked on. When the meal had been eaten, we had gotten... We had got into the car and went for a drive. The effects of the mescaline were already on the decline, but the flowers in the gardens still trembled on the brink of being supernatural. The pepper trees and carobs along the side street still manifestly belonged to some sacred grove. Eden alternated with Dodona, Egypt still with the mystic rose, and then, abruptly, we were at an intersection waiting to cross Sunset Boulevard. Before us, the cars were rolling by in a steady stream, thousands of them all bright and shining like an advertiser's dream, and each more ludicrous than the last. Once again, I was convulsed with laughter. The Red Sea of traffic parted at last, and we crossed into another oasis of trees and lawns and roses. In a few minutes, we had climbed to a vanished point in the hills, and there was a city spread out beneath us. Rather disappointingly, it looked very like the city I had seen on other occasions. So far as I was concerned, transfiguration was proportional to distance. The nearer, the more divinely other, this vast dim panorama was hardly different from itself. We drove on, and so long as we remained in the hills with the view succeeding distant view, its significance was at its everyday level, well below transfiguration point. The magic began to work again only when we turned down into a new suburb and we were gliding between two rows of houses. Here, in spite of the peculiar hideousness of the architecture, there were renewals of transcendental otherness, hints of the morning's heaven. Brick chimneys and green composition roofs glowed in the sunshine like fragments of the New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, And all at once I saw what Gardy had seen and with what incomparable skill had so often rendered in his paintings. A stucco wall with a shadow slanting across it. Blank but unforgettably beautiful. Empty but charged with all the meaning and the mystery of existence. 
The revelation dawned and was gone again within a fraction of a second. The car had moved on. Time was uncovering another manifestation of the eternal suchness. Within sameness, there is a difference, but that difference should be different from sameness is in no wise the intention of all the Buddhas. Their intention is both totality and differentiation. This bank of red and white geraniums, for example, it was entirely different from that stucco wall a hundred yards up the road, but the isness of both was the same. The eternal quality of their transience was the same. An hour later, with 10 more miles and the visit to world's biggest drug store, drug store safely behind us, we were back at home. And I had returned to that reassuring but profoundly unsatisfactory state known as being in one's right mind. <laughs> that humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. Most men and womanly lives at the worst so painful, at the best so monotonous, poor and limited, that the urge to escape, the longing to transcend themselves, if only for a few moments, is and has always been one of the principal appetites of the soul. Art and religion, carnivals and Saturnalia, dancing and listening to oratory, all these have served in H.E. Wells' phrase as doors in the wall. And for private, far everyday use, there have always been chemical intoxicants. All the vegetable sedatives and narcotics, all the euphorics that grow on trees, the hallucinogens that ripen in berries or can be squeezed or can be squeezed from roots, all without exception have been known and systematically used by human beings from time immemorial. And to these natural modifiers of consciousness, modern science has added its quota of synthetics, chloral, for example, and benzedrine, the bromides, and the barbiturates. Most of these modifiers of consciousness of consciousness cannot now be taken except under doctor's orders or else illegally and, illegally and at considerable risk. For unrestricted use, the West has permitted only alcohol and tobacco. All the other chemical doors in the wall are labeled dope, and their unauthorized takers are fiends. We now spend a good deal more on drink and smoke than we spend on education. This, of course, is not surprising. The urge to escape from selfhood and the environment is in almost everyone almost all the time. The urge to do something for the young is strong only in parents and in them only for the few years during which, ch which their children go to school. Equally unsurprising is the current attitude towards drink and smoke. In spite of the growing army of hopeless alcoholics, in spite of the hundreds of thousands of persons annually maimed or killed by drunken drivers, popular comedians still crack jokes about alcohol and its addicts. And in spite of the evidence linking cigarettes with lung cancer, practically everybody regards tobacco smoking as being hardly less normal and natural than eating. Mm, my nose is kind of stuffy, sorry. Uh, from the point of view of the rationalist utilitarian, this may seem odd, for the historian it is exactly what you would expect. A firm conviction of the material reality of hell never prevented medieval Christians from doing what their ambition, lust, or covetousness, covetousness suggested. Lung cancer, traffic accidents, and the millions of miserable and misery-creating alcohol, misery alcoholics are facts even more certain than was in Dante's day, the fact of the inferno. But all such are remote and unsubstantial compared with the near-felt fact of a craving here and now for release or sedation for a drink or a smoke. Ours is the age, among other things, of the automobile and of rocketing population. Alcohol is incompatible with safety on the roads, and its production, like that of tobacco, condemns to virtual sterility many, many millions of acres of the most fertile soil. The problems raised by alcohol and tobacco cannot, as it, it goes without saying, be solved by prohibition. The universal and ever-present urge to self-transcendence is not to be abolished by slamming the currently popular doors in the wall. The only reasonable policy is to open better, other better doors in the hope of inducing men and women to exchange their old habits for new and less harmful ones. Some of these other better doors will be social and technological in nature, others religious or psychological, others dietetic, educational, athletic. But the need for frequent chemical vacations from intolerable selfhood and impulsive surroundings will undoubtedly remain. What is needed is a new drug which will leave and console our suffering species without doing more harm in the long run than it does in the short. 
Such a drug must be potent in minute doses and synthesizable. If it does not possess these qualities, its production, like that of wine, beer, spirits, and tobacco, will interfere with the raising of indispensable food and fibers. It must be less toxic than opium or cocaine, less likely to produce undesirable social consequences than alcohol or the barbiturates, less inimical to heart and lungs than the tars and nicotine of cigarettes. And on the positive side, it should produce changes in consciousness more interesting, more intrinsically valuable than mere sedation or dreaminess, delusions of omnipotence or release from inhibition. To most people, mescaline is almost completely innocuous. Unlike alcohol, it does not drive the taker into the kind of uninhibited action which results in brawls, crimes of violence, and traffic accidents. A man under the influence of mescaline quietly minds his own business. Moreover, the business he minds is an experience of the most enlightening kind, which does not have to be paid for, and is surely important by a compensatory hangover. Of the long-range consequences of regular mescaline taking, we know very little. The Indians who consume peyote buttons do not seem to be physically or morally degraded by the habit. However, the available evidence is still scarce and sketchy. Although obviously superior to cocaine, opium, alcohol, and tobacco, mescaline is not yet the ideal drug. Along with the happy, transfigured majority of mescaline takers, there is a minority that finds in the drug only hell or purgatory. Moreover, for a drug that is to be used, like alcohol, for general consumption, its effects last for an inconveniently long time. But chemistry and physiology are capable nowadays of practically anything. If the psychologists and sociologists would define the ideal, ideal, the neurologists and pharmacologists can be relied upon to discover the means whereby that actual, whereby uh, that ideal can be realized, or at least for perhaps this kind of ideal can never, in the very nature of things, be fully realized. More nearly approached than in the wine bibbing past, the whiskey drinking, marijuana smoking, or bridgewood swallowing per present. The urge to transcend self-conscious self it is, as I have said, a principal appetite of the soul. When, for whatever reason, men and women fail to transcend themselves by means of worship, good works, or spiritual exercises, they are apt to resort to religion's chemical surrogates, alcohol and goof pills in the modern West, alcohol and opium in the East, hashish in the Mohammedan world, alcohol and marijuana in Central America, alcohol and cocoa, coca in the Andes, alcohol in the barbiturates in the more up-to-date regions of South America. In Poison Socrates, Iris Divine's Felipe de Felici has written at length and with a wealth of documentation on the immemorial connection between religion and the taking of drugs. Here in summary or in direct quotation are his conclusions. The employment of religious purposes of toxic substances is extraordinarily widespread. The practices studied in this volume can be observed in every region of the earth, among primitives, no less among those who have reached a high pitch of civilization. We are therefore dealing not with exceptional facts, which might justifiably be overlooked, but with a general and, in the widest sense of the world, in the word, a human phenomenon, the kind of phenomenon which cannot be disregarded by anyone who is trying to discover what religion is and what are the deepest needs which it must satisfy. Ideally, everyone should be able to find self-transcendence in some form or of pure or applied religion. In practice, it seems very unlikely that this hoped for consummation will ever be realized. There are, and doubtless there always will be, good churchmen and good churchwomen for whom, unfortunately, piety is not enough. The late G.K. Chesterton, who wrote at least as lyrically of drink as of devotion, may serve as their eloquent spokesman. The modern churches, with some exceptions among the Protestant denominations, tolerate, tolerate alcohol, but even the most tolerant, tolerant have made no attempt to convert the drug to Christianity or to sacramentalize its use. The pious drinker is forced to take his religion in one compartment, his religion surrogate in another, and perhaps this is inevitable. Drinking cannot be sacramentalized except in religions, which set no store in decorum. The worships, I'm sorry, the worship of Dionysus or the Celtic god of beer was allowed in disorderly affair. The rites of Christianity are incompatible with even religious drunkenness. This does no harm to the distillers, but is very bad for Christianity. 
Countless persons desire self-transcendence and would be glad to find it in church. But alas, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. They take part in rites, they listen to sermons, they repeat prayers, but their thirst remains unassuaged. Disappointed, they turn to the bottle, for a time at least, and in a kind of way it works. Church may still be attended, but is no more than a musical bank of butlers ere all on. God may still be acknowledged, but he is God only on the verbal level, only in a strict Pickwickian sense. The effective object of worship is the bottle, and the sole religious experience is that state of uninhibited and belligerent euphoria which follows the ingestion of the third cocktail. We see then that Christianity and alcohol and alcohol do not mix and cannot mix. Christianity and mescaline seem to be much more compatible. This has been demonstrated by many tribes of Indians from Texas to as far north as Wisconsin. Among these tribes are to be found gossip um, are among to be found groups affiliated with the Native American church, a sect whose principal rite is a kind of early Christian ag agape or love feast where slices of peyote take the place of the sacramental bread and wine these native americans regard the cactus as god's special gift to the indians and equate its effect with the workings of the divine spirit professor j s slotkin one of the very few white men ever to have participated in the rites of a peyotist congregation says of his fellow worshippers that they are certainly not stupefied or drunk they never got out of rhythm or fumbled their words, as a drunken or stupefied man would do. They are all quiet, courteous, and considerate of one another. I have never been in any white man's house of worship where there is either so much religious feeling or decorum. And what we may ask, are these devout and well-behaved peyotists experiencing? Not the mild sense of virtue which sustains the average Sunday's church goer through 90 minutes of boredom. Not even those high feelings inspired by thoughts of the creator and the redeemer the judge and the comforter which animate the pious for these native americans the religious experience is something more direct and illuminating more spontaneous less the homemade product of the superficial self-conscious mind sometimes according to the reports collected by dr slotkin they see visions which may be of christ himself sometimes they hear the voice of the great spirit sometimes they become aware of the presence of god and those personal shortcomings which must be corrected if they are to do as will. The practical consequences of these chemical openings of doors into the other world seem to be wholly good. Dr. Slotkin reports that habitual peyotists are on the whole more industrious, more temperate, many of them abstain altogether from alcohol, more peaceable than non-peyotists. A tree with such satisfactory fruits cannot be condemned out of hands as evil. In sacramentalizing the use of peyote, the Indians of the Native American Church have done something which at once psychologically sound and historically respectable. In the early centuries of Christianity, many pagan rites and festivals were baptized, so to say, and made to serve the purposes of the church, whose jollifications, whose jollifications were not particularly edifying, but they assuaged a certain psychological hunger. And instead of trying to suppress them, the earlier missionaries had the sense to accept to accept them for what they were, soul-satisfying expressions of fundamental urges, and to incorporate them into the fabric of the new religion. What the Mer Native Americans have done is essentially similar. They have taken a pagan custom, a custom incidentally far more elevating and enlightening than most of the rather brutish carousals and memories adopted from European paganism, and given it a Christian significance. Though but recently introduced into the northern united states peyote eating and a religion based upon it have become important symbols of the red man's right to spiritual independence some indians have reacted to white supremacy by becoming americanized others by retreating into traditional indianism but some have tried to make the best of both worlds indeed of all the worlds the best of indianism the best of christianity and the best of those other worlds of transcendental experience where the soul knows itself an unconditioned and of like nature with the divine. This is the Native American church. In it, two great appetites of the soul, the, sur the urge to independence and self-determination and the urge to self-transcendence were fused with and interpreted in the light of a third, the urge to worship, to justify the ways of God to man, to explain the universe by means of a coherent theology. Lo, the poor Indian whose untutored mind clothes him in front, believes him bare behind. 
But actually, it is we, the rich and highly educated whites, who have left our souls bare behind. We cover our interior nakedness with some philosophy. Christian, Marxian, Frodo, phys physicalist, but abaft, we remain uncovered at the mercy of all the winds of circumstance. The poor Indian, on the other hand, has the wit to protect his rear by supplementing the fig leaf of theology with the beach, breech cloth of transcendental experience. I am not so foolish as to equate what happens under the influence of mescaline or of any other drug, prepared or in the future preparable, with the realization of the end and ultimate purpose of human life. Enlightenment, the beatific vision. All I am suggesting is that the mescaline experience is what Catholic theologians call a gratuitous grace, not necessarily to salvation, but potentially helpful and to be accepted, thankfully, if made available. To be shaken out of the ruts of ordinary perception, to be shown for a few timeless hours the outer and the inner world, not as they appear to an animal obsessed with survival or to a human being obsessed with words and notions, but as they are apprehended directly and unconditionally by mind at large. This is an experience of inestimable value to everyone, and especially to the intellectual. For the intellectual is by definition the man for whom, in Goethe's phase, the word is essentially fruitful. He is the man who feels that what we perceive by the eye is foreign to us, and as such, in need, not impress us deeply. And yet, though himself an intellectual and one of the supreme masters of language, Goethe did not agree with his own evaluation of the word. We talk, he wrote in middle life, far too much. We should talk less and draw more. I personally should like to renounce speech altogether and, like organic nature, communicate everything I have to say in sketches. That fig tree, this little snake, the cocoon on my window still quietly awaiting its furniture, all these are momentous signatures. A person able to decipher their meaning properly would soon be able to dispense with the written or the spoken word altogether. The more I think of it, there is something futile. Mediocrity, even I am tempted to say, foppish about speech. I contrast how the gravity of nature and her silence startle you when you stand face to face with her, undistracted before a barren ridge or in the desolation of the ancient hills. It can never dispense with language and the other symbol systems, for it is by means of them and only by their means that we have raised ourselves above the brutes to the level of the human beings. But we can easily become the victims as well as the beneficiaries of these systems. We must learn how to handle words effectively, but at the same time we must preserve and, if necessary, intensify our ability to look at the word directly, and not through that half-opaque medium of concepts which distorts every given fact into the all-too-familiar likeness of some generic label or explanatory abstraction. Literary or scientific, liberal or specialist, all our education is predominantly verbal, and therefore fails to accomplish what it is supposed to do, what it is supposed to do. Instead of transforming children into fully developed adults, it turns out students of the natural sciences who are completely unaware of nature as the primary fact of experience and inflicts upon the world students of the humanities who know nothing of humanity, their own or anyone else's. Gestalt psychologists such as Ramiel Renshaw have devised methods for widening the range and increasing the acuity, acuity of human perceptions, but do our educators apply them? The answer is no. Teachers in every field of psyche, physical skill, from singing to tennis, from tightrope walking to prayer, have discovered, by trial and error, the conditions of optimum functioning within their special fields. But have any of the great foundations financed a project for coordinating these empirical findings into a general theory and practice of heightened creativeness? Again, so far as I am aware, the answer is no. All sorts of cultists and queer fish teach all kinds of techniques for achieving health, contentment, peace of mind, and for many of their hearers, many of these techniques, techniques are demonstrably effective. But do we see respectable psychologists, philosophers, and clergymen boldly descending into those odd and sometimes malodorous wells at the bottom of which poor truth is so often condemned to sit? Yet, once more, the answer is no. And now look at the history of masculine research. Seventy years ago, men of first-rate ability described as transcendental experiences which come to those who, in good health and under proper conditions and in the right spirit, take the drug. How many philosophers, how many theologians, how many professional educators have had the curiosity to open this door in the wall? The answer, for all practical purposes, is none. 
In a world where education is predominantly verbal, highly educated people find it all but impossible to pay serious attention to anything but words and notions. There's always money for, there are always, there are always doctorates in, the learned foolery of research into what for scholars is the all-important problem. Who influenced whom to say what when? <laughs> Even in this age of technology, the verbal humanities are honored. The nonverbal humanities, the arts of being directly aware of the given facts of our existence, it will almost completely, I would say, are almost completely ignored. A catalog, a bibliography, a definitive edition of a third-rate verse years, Epsissima verba, a stupendous index to all and all indexes, any genuinely Alexandrian project is sure of approval and financial support. And when it comes to find out how you and I, our children and grandchildren, may become more perceptive, more intensely aware of inward and out reality, more open to the spirit, less apt by a psychological malpractices to make ourselves physically ill and more capable of controlling our own on a Economic nervous system. When it comes to any form of nonverbal education, more fundamental and more likely to be of some practical use than Swedish drill, no really respectable person in any really respectable university or church will do anything about it. Verbalists are susceptible to the nonverbal. Rationalists fear the given non rational fact. Intellectuals feel that what we perceive by the eye or in any other way is foreign to us as such and need not impress us deeply. Besides, this matter of education in the nonverbal humanities will not fit into any of the established pigeonholes. It is not religion, not neurology, not gymnastics, not morality or civics, nor not even experimental psychology. This being so the subject is, for academic and ecclesiastical purposes, not existent and may safely be ignored altogether or left with a patronizing smile to those whom the Pharisees of verbal orthodoxy call cranks, quacks, charlatans, and unqualified amateurs. I have always found, Blake wrote rather bitterly, that angels have the vanity to speak of themselves as the only wise. This they do with a, confidence in, with a confident insolence sprouting from systematic reasoning. Systematic reasoning is something we could not, as a species or, an indiv or as individuals, possibly do without. But neither, if we are able to remain sane, can we possibly do without direct perception. The more unsystematic, the better, of the inner and outer worlds into which we have been born. This given reality is an infinite which passes all understanding in it and bits of being directly in some sort totally apprehended. It is transcendence belonging to another order than the human and yet and yet it may be present for, to us as a felt eminence and experienced participate participation to be enlightened is to be aware always of total reality in its eminent otherness to be aware of it and yet to remain in a condition to survive as an animal to think and feel as a human being to resort whenever expedient to systematic reasoning our goal is to discover what we've always been where we ought to be and happily we make the test exceedingly difficult for ourselves. Meanwhile, there are gratuitous graces in the form of partial and fleeting realizations under a more realistic, a less exclusively verbal system of education than ours. Every angel, in Blake's sense of the word, would be permitted as a sabbatical treat, would be urged and even, if necessary, compelled to take on take an occasional trip through some chemical door in the wall into the world into the world of transcendental experience. If it terrified him, it would be unfortunate, probably salutary. If it brought him a brief but timeless illumination, so much the better. In either case, the angel might lose a little of the confident insolence sprouting from systematic reasoning and the consciousness of having read all the books. Near the end of his life, a keenest experience infused contemplation. Thereafter, he refused to go back to work on his unfinished book. Compared with this, everything he had read and argued about and written, Aristotle and the sentences, the questions, the propositions, the majestic summas, was no more better shaft or straw. For most intellectuals, such a sit-down strike would be inadvisable, even morally wrong. But the angelic doctor had done more systematic reasoning than any twelve ordinary angels, and was already ripe for death. He had earned the right in those last months of his mortality, to turn away from mere symbolic straw and shaft to the bread of actual and substantial fact. For angels of a lower order and with better prospects of longevity, there must be a return to the straw. 
But the man who comes back through the door in the wall will never be quite the same as the man who went out. He will be wiser but less cocksure, happier but less satisfied, humbler in acknowledging his ignorance, yet better equipped to understand the relationship of words to things, of systematic reasoning to the unfathomable mystery which it tries forever vainly to comprehend. Um, I don't know if that's the full thing. I mean, it seems to be short, but, uh, <clears throat> reading out loud was pretty loud, uh, pretty long. Uh, sorry, man. <clears throat> I know I messed up on a lot of words. Hold on. I should probably mute myself for this. All right. Um, yeah, I just had a lot of phlegm, um, and I was, uh, my throat's parched, and um, a lot of the words, uh, you remember, he wrote this probably in 1953. His um, verbal usage of, of words were, are mighty fine and quite different of this day. You read his work right there, and you read some news article of today, and man, not the same. Um, as far as his his uh, experience with mescaline, it seems comparable, but not quite the same as ayahuasca. And um, still, I will agree on many sentiments that he had. Uh, and there's a, a lot of it that resonates with my experiences with I guess you could say the um, being in between the inside and the outside of the door on the wall. Thanks, altering current. Excuse me. I ate a banana too, and that seems to. Whew. Um. Yeah, you really aren't the same. Um. Going out that door as you are coming back. But uh. I mean, how he can put all those into words into just describing accurately how the experience went. This, the, 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 Aldous Huxley does not, is probably a little bit too humble. I mean, he credits a lot of poets and things like that, but his usage of uh, English literatures and uh, his knowledge of um, art is way over my head um and i may have to revisit that just so i can look at some of these uh artwork and paintings and just see what he saw maybe the the folds of a, a drapery is um is something that might spark what i remember from <laughs> some of the things within ayahuasca uh but yeah uh, it's look, what's what's weird to me. It was when he's saying that um, research with mescaline was as far back as seventy years, and that was in nineteen fifty three. So that means in around eighteen eighty three, they've been researching mescaline all this time, and even in nineteen fifty three, it's like pretty innocuous, and yet it's a schedule one drug or is it class A? I, I get those mixed up today. Um, which is really weird. And of course, they synthesized it way back even in the 1950s. Um, and plenty of drugs are synthesized today. And I would say it's been allowed by the governments. Oh. Uh, but that, again, is going to be another topic. Um, as far as the doors of perception... Well, he mentions a few key words, and one of the key uh, words that have been resonating with me quite often, but I haven't been able to piece it together, was manifest destiny, which, of course, if everyone studies manifest destiny, is something as a part of history uh, with the United States. But yeah, it's a different term uh, that he used, and I haven't quite figured out <laughs> its meaning. And uh, that's the biggest takeaway, and I think the experience is very different for everybody. Um, I think because from his experience, as he went out that door, 
he can only remember just the the things that he learned on this side in order to understand the the things that he sees outside, which is actually inside. Which is, whew, yeah, it's getting it's kind of weird. Um. <clears throat> so when I often experience when I experience my ayahuasca experiences through that doorway of of, of worlds. Um, I would not have described it in in art. I would not expressed it in in words. Um, it was more of a realization. Uh, because when, I guess hmm, uh, you would have to first describe oneself in order to not describe oneself, type of thing, and um, that that's just confusing. Um, Hi, Port Foam Co-op. Thanks again. Uh, man, I don't know why. You, you know, you, I will read out your stuff even if you don't, if you don't uh, do a super chat. But um, Port Foam Co-op says, Will there be a great awakening? Return to order. Um, all I could say is that We are expecting the unexpected. We're not looking to return and um, repeating the same things because we've already experienced those aspects. So we're waiting on something amazing and unexpected. Uh, whether that is a great awakening, uh, I don't know at most maybe return to another order or re or not return but maybe a turning to another order or turning to a certain chaos but um there's something that's been lingering in the back of my mind from history for all i can kind of realize from my experiences is the first time you go through anything and for me it was movies but now when i'm looking back through your entire life that you can remember it's just the way that you you just experienced it and you look back on certain things at a certain point in time and you have feelings associated with it you have memories that that resonated with uh how you how you felt and how it carries over to to you now second time you look over it's about these little details that you notice at those moments that for no reason at all you're you were focusing on them in order to remember them it's kind of like uh, associating a uh, an event with a particular smell you know uh, you hear stories of uh, of people who are in some type of crime crime scene where they remember the event and they smell a peculiar odor uh, that no one else may have smelled it's it's that same concept so um it, it's you go through a second time you'll notice those little uh those little easter eggs is what i would call it just like in movies you know they have those easter eggs where um, you notice it that no one else will notice and you go hey that easter egg that right there if you notice that that has a little bit of meaning so third time you go about it is you understand the meaning and you understand why it happened at that point and it's all a sign <laughs> to point to so that you understand that um, you were aware of that back then so you can be aware of it now because it's it's important for you to know that in a certain point in time where you're going to need to know that <laughs> and that's why I laugh, or, or at least I laughed when I was reading through this piece. There are certain moments of time where I was Hugsley experienced that same experience, and um, I, I it's uh, for me it is it is inexplainable in words. All right, I'm gonna read over. Uh, was there an order, Kathy B? Happy to chip in, Port Foam Cop. Thank you. Um, 
Kathy B is a rhetorical question that mean meant to insult. Insult. Uh, port film co-op. It feels like we are in a degenerate time, like end of Rome, Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. It is unsustainable. Can't work. Has never worked, but we are doing it, perhaps with closed eyes. Uh, Kathy B, I know what you mean. Port from co-op. We complain about Christianity, but by ending it, we have created a vacuum for Marxism and chaos. It's clear cause and effect. Um, I, I I think what um so the thing that I was saying about something being in the back of my mind is um I've had ideas in my mind where because I used to want to be a writer and write books just creative stories i don't i didn't really care um about grammar or any of the fundamental rules of writing it's had the creative side of just having certain uh events and settings take place and just go with that and i could fill in all the other details later as far as like character development and in details and prose and all that stuff and so, you know, all the other stuff just kind of got in my way. And I was like, okay, I don't really care about the book. I just like the, I, the, the storytelling part, you know. And the part, the part that's important that I focused on was more of the plot and not necessarily the character development. So I never had any of those details. And I would have these ideas out there. And then, but I'd be so kind of uh, depressed that I can't share that the the story with anybody i will tell someone you know and um after i tell someone a, a few months or a year or two later it becomes a book or it's in some type of show or it's in a movie and i'm like did they get their idea on their own or did somehow someone overhear me wrote the book and wrote the story and it became a show and a movie because it's the same thing that I thought of I held it for a long long time and no one came up with it until I said it out loud and I feel as though that <clears throat> there are there may be something some watchers or something or listeners where when you manifest it into when you voice it out there that that mm, they can they can hear it or it can resonate or someone else can pick it up it it, it gets out there um and so if you're going to be planning on something it has to be to react to the chaos and not necessarily reacting to something that's planned in an orderly fashion and i think that's why when i revisit some of the movies in certain times why i i re-watched them so many times is because there was meaning behind it and how to how to um how to go about certain situations and react to them um which i always bring back crimson crimson tide it's with gene hackman as a uh captain and um denzel washington as a uh um second in command and um in a nuclear submarine i would say i agreed with as i was watching i agreed more with denzel washington and the way he did things and then now after uh, 20 30 years or so 20 about 20 years i would say i don't know 20 yeah 25 years or t something yeah very close to that i i now resonate with the the methodology used by gene hackman is um even though it's more reckless you want to prepare for during chaotic situations rather than going by the book with safety first and, and in times where you need to make sure you're able to to fulfill a objective so it's like planning imagine you feel like you're the best strategist you've you've studied all of history all the great generals and admirals out there and captains or whatever and just all the tactics and you're ready for anything by just doing the usual observing your enemy enemy and and the way that they move and and just uh what they have as far as um 
equipment and uh, what they typically did for their history of, of, of execution and things like that. If you got backup plan B, backup plan C, and so you're ready. You're like, no way they're going to win because you, you, you've done your due diligence, you've studied, and you're prepared for um, all the potential uh, alternative moves that you could think of. And then the time comes when you're faced against them and they do something that you didn't think of. And you are now losing the battle and most likely the war. And what do you do? <laughs> you are not prepared because you weren't prepared for the unexpected. Uh, and so it is that type of uh, thing where you listen to certain stories of just out of nowhere, like admirals and generals within history where they overcame just a greater force and they really had not as much um i would say um <sighs> there's a certain word for it um official training i guess right they just had a lot of uh, experience um figured out hey this is what the enemy is planning to do because you know he's a studied individual you would go by the textbook <laughs> and so you're not going to you're not going to defeat an enemy by by doing the textbook moves that they already know is is not going to work so you have to do something uh, rash and and um unthought of you you're, it's very zen like now that i've been covering a lot of zen it's uh, you're reacting uh but not, not thinking about how you're reacting but reacting in, in a way that's most fitting for the situation uh, so thing, things like that and that's why a lot of these topics is, is hard to cover because I'm not one of those people who are very eloquent in their in their writings or in their <laughs> presentation you know I, I could watch um, people who are on YouTube who are very charismatic and maybe even use their same tone of voice or maybe even change it up but uh, that wouldn't be me and i wouldn't be spontaneous i might have like a teleprompter words already set up for me but um that again that wouldn't be just spontaneity which which would have something new and original that might come up where if i was just going by the book or what i wrote before uh, something someone says in in chat, like uh, Kathy B or Port Film Co-op, would spur something that really triggered a response where I wouldn't either have to ignore it and just keep going on what I wrote uh, before the show in order to keep keep going at it, or I can just go ahead and just follow my uh, instincts and say, okay, yeah, I'll just jump to that because that. That resonates with something that I feel like it should be shared. Now is the time to share it. Even though I'm not prepared to share it, maybe I'll get better at sharing it at a later point in time. Um, so a lot of this that you'll you'll notice is uh, one of the things that I know is in the Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley that there are certain things he even he even said. I think it was page 17. I think Kathy, you were even uh, looking at it where there. Are, uh, some sometimes people are fine are good and sometimes people just it's hell or purgatory in their experience and certain people know what they need to do they don't have to do it but they they understand what they need to do and that was like me um, with my experiences is I knew what I had to do uh, all this Huxley explained it in terms of in order to fulfill uh, his like in uh, the the highest God um, is his will and it's very similar to that although I it wasn't a um, monotheistic God it was the all God highest God order but uh, in order to um to get to the point where you can understand and uh realize all this 
it is more of a we or us uh, situation. It's not something that can be done alone. And I don't know why that is. I don't, I can't explain it. Um, I could think about it, but I, I wouldn't know. Um, it's just something that is known, but can't be explained to be known. <laughs> it's, that's the hardest part. And I think that's, I wonder if that's like the whole Gnostic thing or like the Taoist thing or the Zen thing is like, uh, it becomes a, a knowing, but it's not a belief. And, um, can't it can't be uh explained very well um so therefore how do you get people to understand the only way i could think of it is to actually take the experience have the experience and that's all i keep saying once you have the experience it's almost annoying and you just it's like um when you know someone pretty well and you, you just kind of know what they're thinking and what they're going to do and just you anticipate it and words never get crossed you just know you know situation comes up and you just share a look it's like yeah you, you know what's up you know what you're supposed to do you know it, it's just it's just right there it's you're just ready at it and it, i think that's probably the same point with many people who have these experiences uh, and there are certain, definitely different levels. People who take it once, three times like me. Maybe some people take it many more times. I don't know how, uh, what, what they experience in those further experiences. Um, for example, ayahuasca and my last third and last experience was, was, it was known that I didn't need to take it anymore. I just throw it all away and, um, never take it again. It's like, and I know why, <laughs> but I wonder if I did take it, what would I experience, you know? And I wonder if it's just a, a thing, like it'd be more of a warning, like it wouldn't be like a good experience. It would just be a, a thing is, um, we told you not to take, take this again because you didn't need to, and yet you took it again. And thus we want to make sure you don't take it again. So we're going to give you a bad experience <laughs> type of thing. So um that's kind of what i know or feel and expect that would happen and therefore i don't want to take it because i have <laughs> i wouldn't know otherwise but then it might i might and the whole point of the third and final experience was not to be distracted by all the flowers the chairs the wool or the you know the things that he was just mesmerized by is like he could spend eternity just being lost in that and that those are distractions and again he uses that term to the word specific word distraction um those distractions are there to distract you not just here but also out and in there that whatever it is and yes you could try to go it all alone but uh and he mentions that too, but you won't succeed. You, it has to be. That's why, like in Buddhism, they have someone there, not necessarily uh, uh, there at the time of taking, but there as a um, an understanding that when you're taking it, that when you're experiencing, you're letting go. That in order to stay existent is the best term I could just describe it you need you need a constant and that's why it's important to try not to wrong people by doing wrong um, and try to as much as you can get your family closer get your friends closer and things like that and not push them away it's um, if you can at all possible try to keep them close even with differences and and uh, just try to just uh be the first to resolve the um the conflict i guess and just to be that is just doing the the mending you know it has to start and as long as you start it, that's usually that that's good enough. 
um, the other part you have no control over, right? So if you're going to end a conflict, you can start it off, but you have no control on when it's going to be engaged or when it's going to end. You just know that it can be started. And for, for, for our purposes, we're here to be engaged, to not be distracted. And there's, there's reasons to be engaged. And many of that might have to do with a lot of the, the mythological scriptures you know, way back. And a lot of it's repeated and, you know, it's, it's, um, excuse me. It's, um, hmm. it's a path that's tried and true but uh that same path won't work for you it has to be your own path but the concept the um, the general realization of of these types of actions that's that's there and available for you uh to understand that's for me to understand that's what at most i can share but a lot of the stuff that I share actually is there in certain scriptures out there, in, in religions out there, except that the religions have kind of done away with um, these types of concepts in return to keep people in that religion, to keep people in doing those rituals and keep people in, uh, in as a form of control. But... Uh, necessarily those people who are within those religions aren't getting and again alluded to by Aldous Huxley aren't getting what they need they're going to stay in there for all the things that they don't want to lose but they're not in there originally for what they need of what they they want to fulfill spiritually or or the will of God or whatever however you want to say it it's um that's that's religion as it is now and has been for quite a while uh, that's why we're in the situation uh, of all the things where we see, uh, or you might call it degradation. Um, because we're too afraid to lose what we have in order to gain something better. And that gaining of better, something better is not necessarily something that's materially seen or gained. It's a, uh, it's an acknowledgement of wisdom, I guess. And um, if you're expecting material gain, don't expect it from from spirituality or from wisdom. If you want material gain, do what the materialists are doing because that's how you gain it. <laughs> but if you want to gain something else, which gonna which can carry over, I would say, um, like. My experiences, and just like Aldous Huxley's experience with mescaline, um, we carry over what we know and who we know. And um, the things that aren't necessarily us or the I. We, we don't carry over our ego. We don't carry over our wealth. We don't carry over our currency, our materials. We don't carry over all the things that we have around us. We carry over our experiences where it's not about our our ego. We carry over everything else. Imagine carrying over the er every experience you have gained, but without your ego involved in it. Then that necessarily is you, but in the context of others knowing you. Otherwise, your I is not going to exist. Your yourself, your ego. That's that's your death. In your death, nothing on, on this plane is going to carry over. None of your wealth, none of your material possessions, not even your ego. What carries over is what was you in the eyes of those that care about you. That's all I can, that's the best way I can say it in words until I figure a better way of saying it or visualizing it. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that uh, Aldous Huxley did, very well written in trying to describe it in words and it's a shame and it's good i mean it's a shame that um people's ability to write linguistically isn't around these days like 
people like Aldous Huxley because when I was reading what he wrote, it was difficult. <laughs> I had I I'm pretty sure I blotched so many words, but it was it was um not just beautifully written with certain types of prose and and wordage, but it was reiterated to to a point of just you get it when he says it and uh it, it, he he references back to a certain point a certain uh, passage and and it just re re um it ingra it ingrains in you i guess that's the word you could say man I, you know i really would love to have this type of conversation with someone else who've had these type of these types of experiences and just uh try to better pass along um ways to understand the experience for me it was the takeaway of the experience and the realizations of it and and i think that was just the importance of it you know um all the other stuff can 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 just be just um discarded even though it was important it was important for me but as far as the realization and meaning it's not important for anyone else and, and if anyone else wants to understand those types of differences i i definitely suggest that you take the experience yourself and um you're going to come away with it with the same probable realizations that i have uh thanks kathy um so that's it for this episode um i don't know if anyone wants to talk about anything in particular for the next one after this i was like i don't know what else to think about my mind is just uh just kind of right now just kind of declining off of this topic and i'm not even thinking about the next one so if anyone wants to chime in now on chat otherwise i think i might call it a night because i kind of did two small episodes today and this long reading which has left my throat dry and parched and i'm out of water here um otherwise i'll see you guys tomorrow uh tomorrow i don't know what i'll do during the day just whatever catches my again it's all spontaneous i don't have anything planned and usually it's stuff where i see people um you know uh, uploading stuff and, and you know it's usually just the big stuff that's happening already in mainstream media with the alternative twist um one thing that i might go over tomorrow because on fridays again we're, we kind of go into politics i think tomorrow i might revisit maxwell uh, jordan maxwell uh I thought it's, I mean, his stuff is still good, resonates in, in ways and get you to understand it and still get you to the same point of things are not like you think it is. Um, but from his angle, from the occult uh, and the old religions type of uh, take on it, which I was very interested way back. But once I took the ayahuasca experiences, it was... I didn't need to, all of that stuff. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's not um, important. right? Just because we laugh at something that's ridiculous doesn't mean it's uh, unimportant. Anyways, uh, thank you everyone. And um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good night.